good. Would you guys mind standing up this morning? We're going to jump right into some praise and worship this morning. Our God is so good all the time. Amen? All right, here we go. Praise the Lord. 
to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for you. I see his wounds, his hands and feet, my Savior on that curse. body bound and drenched in tears I laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all you, Lord. You deserve our praise. God, we join with all of creation singing your praise, Lord, here this morning. We can trust you, God. Whatever the circumstances going on around us, God, when we look and transfix our eyes into yours, it all fades away. God, we declare right now our trust in you. No matter what, God, we trust you. We worship you. We have the honor and privilege to come before you and encounter you, God. You're so good, Lord. You're so good. Let's 
let's sing that as a church one more time. And if you weren't declaring it as truth, if, we, if you weren't singing with everything you have inside, if you were holding back, I challenge you, let's push it. Let's declare that our God is good. He deserves your praise, whether you feel like it or not. And I promise you, if you don't feel like praising and you press through and you do it, something's on the other side of that. There's a peace, there's a joy. So let's sing that chorus one more time and let's, let's push it. right where we're at, God. Thank you for being in control, God. God, if I was in control, things would look a mess, God. But we can trust you. We can trust you in the night when we can't see what's going on. We can trust you in the day, Lord. God, I just pray that every person here puts an anchor in you right here, right now. Because you're the only solid rock we can stand on. God, just continue to do what you're doing. Thank you for your presence here this morning, God. Thank you for restoring lives. Thank you for meeting with every single person right where they're at. God, just continue to have your way here this morning, God. Continue to speak to hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. I'm Alexa, and welcome to church. While you go ahead and get settled in your seats, take a moment to locate your cell phones. Please throw those on silent to help us cut down on distractions during the service. Next, we want to extend a big thank you to everyone who volunteered this past month at the Mount Horeb Community Clothes Closet. Each October, Life Church volunteers work to provide the service to our community. With many of you pitching in, everyone only had to work a few hours. Thank you to Ann Snyder for organizing the volunteers and helping us make a visible impact in Mount Horeb. And listen up, ladies, it's time to mark your calendars for our annual Ornament Exchange on Friday, December 4th at 6.30 p.m. This is going to be our 20th year in a row, 2-0. Can you believe it? This event is always full of festive fun, and who can't use some extra joy in their life this year, right? It's super simple. Just bring a wrapped ornament to exchange along with a dish to pass. And please let us know you're coming by signing up at Guest Central today. Next Sunday is the deadline for Operation Christmas Child. You have just one more week to shop and fill up those shoe boxes. Please bring your packed shoe boxes back to church next Sunday with a check for shipping. And parents, do you have a student in grades 5 through 12? Well, if so, drop them off for movie night on Friday, November 20th, starting promptly at 6.30 p.m. We'll be watching episodes 2 and 3 of the Chosen series right here at church. Snacks will be provided, and please have them bringing as many friends as they can. And lastly, if your kiddos get a little restless during the service, head on over to the cafe just through the double doors on your right where the service is always streaming live, so you won't have to miss a thing. Thanks so much for listening, and happy Sunday.
Good morning. Wow, a little heavy. Hey, I was thinking, aren't you glad Nick is not in charge? Yeah, man, I gave a thumbs up. Cool, Nick, you're right. I'm, not, I'm glad I'm not in charge too, man. We, we could start a not in charge club, right? And uh, let God be in charge. That's cool. Hey, um, as you know, Debbie and I were, uh, we were on a vacation and we thoroughly enjoyed ourselves. But in the midst of uh, that time, we often thought of you, our family in Mount Horeb uh, at Life Church. And it's good to see you. Wednesday uh, was our first uh, you know, connection from after being away. And it was just good to see everybody. So, uh, man, we sure appreciate everybody and all the volunteers and all those who serve faithfully. At Life Church. So, uh, last night I went for a walk, and and I've I've said this before, but I'm telling you, man, the stars were like on. I don't know if you noticed, but the constellations were just very vibid. And uh, just standing out there, saying, "God, you are amazing, your creation." And um, so I came back, and I was sitting on my front porch, and my neighbor across the street came home, and. I yelled at him, and he couldn't hear me. So we um, we crossed the street and ended up talking. And after after a conversation, I just said, "Man, look at the stars tonight. You know, look at them. You see the handiwork of the Lord, and the stars are worshiping the Lord. All creation worships, and you and I created in the." In the image of God, we have the opportunity to to worship Him as well. So, um, yeah. So, Bo and Renata are in the back row, um, pastors at Hope Hill in New York City. They are on a sabbatical right now, so you'll you'll see more of them, and uh, it's good to have them around the neighborhood. And uh, yeah. As you know, we've been walking through the book of 1 Thessalonians. I want to thank Travis for holding the fort uh, while we're gone. He, uh, he jumped into 1 Thessalonians 2. So, yeah, we're, we're grateful for, for um, everything, man, uh, everything that's going on. Those of you uh, watching online, you want to pull out your, your notes on uh, Facebook, Life Church Facebook, the Life Church webpage. Um, I've already printed mine off, so I'm ahead of you. Those of you that are here in the auditorium, we have Bibles on the back row. We encourage people to bring their Bibles, but if they don't have them, by all means, you want to you wanna grab one because we read from it. Not only do we read from it, but we hopefully apply it and obey it in our lives. So uh, we want to encourage you to do that. As well. Back in December 1988, there was an Armenian earthquake that needed only four minutes to really flatten the nation and in the process, ki- process killing 30,000 people. And moments after that deadly tremor stopped, the father raced to the elementary school where his son had been attending. And of course, his passion was to see if his son was alive. And when he arrived, he saw that the school had been leveled. And looking at the mass of rubble, he remembered the promise that he had made his son earlier in his life. No matter what happens, I'll always be there for you. That was resonating within his, within his mind and driven by that promise, he located what he thought would have been the classroom where his son would have been sitting when the earthquake hit. He began to pull rocks off piles. The people that had gathered around the school, they told him, hey, man, it's too late. You know they're all dead. You can't help. The police came up to him. They said, you know, you need to go home. It's not worth it. On and on. But the father refused. For eight hours, he was out there pulling rock off piles, 16 hours, 32 hours, 36 hours. Man, he was physically exhausted, but he would not give up. 
His hands were raw. His strength was gone. He refused to quit. Why? Because of the promise that he had made his son. Finally, after 38 hours, he pulled back the boulder and he heard his son's voice. He called his boy's name, Armin, Armin. And the voice answered, yeah, dad, it's me. <laughs> and the boy added, hey, I told the other kids around not to worry. I told them if you were alive, you'd save me. And when you saved me, they'd be saved too. Because you promised no matter what, I'll always be there for you. It's a good story. Good story. You know what? God's made promises to you and I as well through his word. And the cool thing is God does keep his promises. Like this father in Armenia, man, our heavenly father, it's not in his character to lie. And he gives the truth and he gives promises that you and I can bank our lives on. And yes, we know in this world there, there's going to be earthquakes. You know, maybe not physical ones, but maybe emotional, spiritual. It feels like the rocks are falling in on you. Maybe you have doubts about God's promises. But here's the thing. At the end of the day, it's good to settle it and realize that your heavenly father does not lie. And he is a God who keeps his promises. And so this morning, we want to encourage all of us. I don't know where you are, where you've been spiritually, what journey you're on. You might be seeking God. You might be stumbling with God right now. Maybe you've got a lot of questions in your faith walk. Wherever it is, I believe God's word is going to help you today. And so... John 14, 3, Jesus put it this way, when everything's ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Just like the boy in Armenia, he had the promise of his father. We've got the promise of Jesus here. And I think going back to John 14, those first three verses in, in context, I understand, man, we look at our world today. And our hearts can be troubled, can't they? And some of you are going through trouble right now. All different kinds of trouble. And God knows exactly what you're going through. And Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let that be at the end of the day. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so... Would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And when everything's ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Man, I am so glad. I'm so glad for that promise. I'm banking my life on that. Are you? I'm looking forward to the day when Jesus comes for his bride. Speaking about, speaking about the bride, I was thinking... Um, Revelation 19, 7, let us be glad and rejoice and let us give honor to him for the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb and his bride has prepared herself. His bride, who's the bride? It's the church, man. It's you, the body of Christ. The bride. I don't know about you, but man, I remember my wedding day. Um, it's been a long time ago, but it's still fresh in my mind. And I remember my wife. She wasn't my wife yet, but she was, the doors were open, boom, and she was next to her dad. I was up here. Did I have my jeans on? Was I, kept, did I, have, was I, was I just chilling, man? No, man, I had prepared myself. I took a shower. <laughs> and I read her the tuxedo, man. I put some time and effort into it. That was a big day. But I remember her walking down, and man, I, I thought my feet were off the ground, you know. I thought my whole body, it was just, took my breath away. Friends, there is something about the church, the bride. The bridegroom, Jesus, is coming. And we want to prepare ourselves. We want to be ready. This is not a ho-hum 
you know, event on the history of the world. No, no, no. On the timeline when Jesus comes, we have an opportunity right here, right now to prepare ourselves for that great day. You know, I'm taking that seriously. There's some people that are just blowing it off. You know, it's just, it's just no big deal. Getting distracted, pressures of life, troubles of the world, they just kind of wear you down. And we lose perspective of what that main event is, the coming of the Lord. And once again, if you've been taken off the rails spiritually, I want to encourage you, purpose in your heart to get back on again. Because, man, Jesus loves you so much. If he didn't love you, why would he want you to hang out with him forever? Right? Why would he want that? It's because of his great love. He loves you. Lord, we pause. To say thank you for the promises you've made. We, your promises have, have, have come true. We, we've seen so many of them. And there's a handful left. We're grateful that we can have our lives in the, hand, in the hands of the creator of the universe. You know, in the hands that knitted us together. Lord, your love, your love, your passion for each one of us in this room, those watching online, help us not, oh, God loves me, and you know, let's not put it down, Lord, it's amazing, it's amazing, and so thank you for the opportunity we have this morning to read your word and apply it to our life. Oh God, it's so easy just to come to church and you know, we think, man, I put my time in, I'm good for the week, but Lord, help us to swing wide the doors to our hearts, our souls this morning and allow you to walk the corridors of every part of us. Because God, honestly, you know, uh, it's tough at times. It is, man. It's tough. But we're grateful that you are living inside of us to make that difference. And so thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Going along that same line in 1 John 3, um, 2 and 3, dear friends, we are already God's children but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears, but we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. Here it is, here it is, verse 3. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. You see that? That's our responsibility. God is holy. Because God is holy, he wants us to be holy to mirror his character. We're not going to be perfect, but we can, we can make that uh, a goal, a daily goal, that I will follow after Christ and I will model his character. And we lean on his Holy Spirit to help make that happen. And so all of us who have this eager expectation, we will keep ourselves pure just as he is pure. And I'm, once again, let's, let's um, make that our pursuit, our goal in life. Okay, you good with that? Yo? All right, good, good. Number one in your notes, live in the light now. Um, live in the light now. Verse 8. Um, but let us live in the light, those of us who live in the light, be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation for God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. 
Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. So, so, Paul says, encourage each other. How's that going for you? Huh? And build each other up, just as you're already doing. Verse 12, dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work and live peacefully with each other. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy, encourage those who are timid, take tender care of those who are weak, be patient with everyone, see that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. Amen. Amen. That's God's word. And so we say yes to God's word today. We say yes to that. So in the beginning here at verse 8, we're picking up where Travis left off. Uh, and just so everybody knows, that's why we're doing this. <laughs> Paul uses a metaphor here in verse 8 of a soldier. If you notice, uh, Paul hung around, he hung out with soldiers quite a bit. Why, why was that? Because he got arrested, you know, he got thrown in prison, he got thrown in jail, and so he, he became very familiar with the Roman military. And so he often uses them as uh, a metaphor, visuals, uh, as, a, as a man and woman of God. And so he, he bases this command on our, our position as a follower of Christ. Why? Because, here it is, we're living in the light. Aren't you glad for that? We're living in the light. And because we live in the light... What does Paul say? We need to be clear-headed. And um, Ephesians 5, 8 through 10, it says, For once you were full of darkness. I'm glad I'm not full of darkness anymore. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have the light from the Lord. So live as people of light. Paul is saying, do not, do not allow the darkness to invade your space because when you put your faith in Jesus Christ say goodbye to darkness and live in the light let the power of almighty God live through you and in this dark world your light will shine bright verse 9 for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true carefully carefully verse 10 determine what pleases the Lord just a footnote there that is my Another goal I have in life, that I will determine what pleases the Lord. I will determine that. I want to live my life pleasing to the Lord. How about you? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, so verse 17, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. In other words, do what pleases the Lord. Um, That goes right along with what Paul's writing here. Clear-headed, we can understand that stress, anxiety of life, Uh, our minds, our our thoughts could be uh, full of distractions, clouded, Um, we don't see clearly. Paul is saying as a follower of Christ, we have, because we have the light, light helps us see where we need to go, right? So we need to be clear-headed to see what God wants us to do and live our lives. That means in this world of darkness and night, You and I, as a follower of Christ, should live our lives different from the world. I know that's pretty basic, but unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be happening in Christianity in America. You you look at stats coming out. So many Christians, their life is not any different than the world. And I think that must grieve the Lord. It really must grieve him because we are not we are not being the billboards that represent him well. So clear headed means to be sober, to be calm and collected in spirit. He uh, he talks about this armor of faith and love 
That's where going to a Roman soldier once again, the breastplate of righteousness, that's where he's coming from, with faith and love. Faith is that, um, that anchor that holds us steady, that love that we get from him, we distribute. So it's on the inside and we give it out on the outside. Um, that's what we're into. Faith in God protects us inwardly. The love for people protects us outwardly. And so here's, here's an, an, the other thing Paul says. And wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. The helmet. What's that about? It guards, it guards our minds from the attacks of the enemy. That helmet, Paul is saying, it will, the battleground of your mind will be protected. Keeps us from going into the wasteland, into the land of the wilderness, the thoughts that can lead us to a bad place. Paul says, no, no, you've got uh, that helmet. That helmet is the confidence of your salvation. So there we have it. Um, Romans 13, 11, 12, this is all the more urgent for you know how late it is. How late is it? It's late. It's late. And you were on time today. But that's not what Paul's talking about. It's late. It's late, in other words, in the the calendar that the Lord has in heaven. It's late. Time is running out. Wake up for our salvation is near now. The coming of the Lord is, is near now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here, the coming of the Lord. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. That's a good word of encouragement right there. Yeah. Thank you, Paul, for writing Romans 13. Because we can sure apply that to our lives. Number two, thank you, Jesus. Verse 9, for God chose to save us. Why, why this, this uh, armor that Paul's talking about in verse 8? He, he takes that next step. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. What, what does that mean that Christ chose to save us? Verse 10 gives us the answer. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. Do you know it's God's will not to pour out his anger? Now, being a parent, we set guidelines for our kids, you know? And, and when they chose to disobey, we would have a, a discussion about it. And, and so... I saw how my dad, when he disciplined, there were times he kind of got out of control, and I'm not blaming him for that. I'm just saying that that was his style. But what I tried to set up is when there's disobedience, when, when the line's been crossed, you must want a spanking. Because love disciplines, right? So we would have this discussion. Now, most of the time, I would say I wasn't angry. I mean, there were, there were times when maybe we got into the teen years where there were battle lines drawn, you know. You know what I'm talking about. Righteous anger. The, the controlled anger is this, that justice must be served. Because I love you, I must discipline you. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't discipline you. Because you disobeyed, you must want a spanking, so therefore I'm giving you what you want. That was the dialogue, pretty much. And um, they said, thank you, thank you. That's what I needed. That came about 20 years later, but... Man, yeah, yeah, that, that's it. So the same thing is with God. When you think, when that word angered, please don't go off the rails on that. It simply means that God is a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. And when people, when, when the entire world is lined up, God is saying, going down the line to each human being, saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. 
My son died for you. He took your place on the cross. He paid for your sin debt in full. It's a free gift. Put your faith in me, and you can be with me forever. But at the end of the day, if you choose to reject him and say, no, I don't want that, I don't want that, then what does God do? God gives you what you chose. Justice must be served. When you have sex traffickers, when you have criminals, when you have even a good person, a good person who has said no to God, in the eyes of God, those, that's the rejection. And so God must be a God of love, but he also must be a God of justice to see it through. So that brings us back to thank you, Jesus, when, when we see that confidence of our salvation from verse 8b, God has made the decision not to pour out his anger on us. And so when I, when I read this text, you know, what, you know what happened? I thought of Hillsong's Thank You, Jesus song, the lyrics that are on the screen. Thank you, Jesus, you set me free. Christ, my Savior, you rescued me. You've given me life. You've opened my eyes. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We can go into that song right now, but we better not. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. The image, I have to tell you, the last few weeks, this image has been in my, in my mind, and it's, it's simply this, with my hands raised before him. Lord, I surrender to you. I choose to surrender to you. I need you. I lift my hands to you, Lord. I honor you. I surrender to you. So thank you, Jesus, for saving me. So I will not, you will not experience the wrath of God when you stand before him. Aren't you glad for that? You will not experience that. The death penalty that you and I deserve because of sin in our lives has been forgiven when we put our faith in Christ. And when Jesus sees you, he sees the righteousness of Christ. And so we stand before God. He says, you are my son, you are my daughter, I love you. You are part of my family. So that leads me to say, thank you, Jesus. How about you? Thank you, Lord. Man. Man, I, I, the, the older I get, the more I, grace I realize God's poured into me. 1 Peter 1, 18, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold and silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as a ransom long before the world began. And now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. Through Christ, you have come to trust in God, and you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. There it is. He paid. And so we can say, thank you, Lord. Number three, stay alive. <laughs> stay. Sorry about that. Uh, stay involved. <laughs> I know you're alive. That's cool. That's good. Uh, actually, that was a, a slip-up by me, sorry. Uh, stay involved, verse 11, so encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. This is not the time to sit on the sidelines. <laughs> Life is either a great adventure or nothing, Helen Keller. She was brilliant. Don't sit on the sidelines. 
that this is not the time in history for you to sit on the sidelines spiritually. Let's, let's see the next one here. It's not the time for you to be the Lone Ranger either. Right? It's not the time. Let me tell you something. COVID-19, there's a lot of Lone Rangers out there. Friends. This is not the time to be a Lone Ranger. We need to stay involved. That's why Paul, in his writing to the church in Thessalonica, a young church, a new church, they're facing persecution, they're facing hardship. And, and Paul, what does he say? Encourage each other. Do you realize Wednesday when I was here, there was a dude, we ended up talking for about 10 minutes. He encouraged me. And I think I encouraged him. But it was cool. You know what that means? We need each other. Man, we need each other right now. No Lone Rangers, no on the sidelines. No, 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 no. No, it's time to become fully engaged. That's what Paul is saying to the church. This is a young church, man. And he's saying, stay involved. Stay involved. Encourage each other um, and build each other up just as you're already doing. That's the cool thing. Um, I, I, thought, I thought about this um, back in the day when I was a young man and the church I, I grew up in, um, the thought occurred to me, you know, nobody's coming up to me to say hi. And it was like the Lord tapped me on the shoulder and he says, dude, dude, why don't you go up to somebody and say hi to them? Wow, that's profound. <laughs> Pretty profound, huh? It's kind of like, um, you know, the title here. It's not about you, it's about God in you. We as human beings, we always want the pat on the back, you know, I need that, you know, it's all about me. No, it's not about you. That little tap on the shoulder that God gave to me radically changed my life. I started going up to people, no matter how old they were, how young. I just said, hey, how's it going? Hello. And it, it was fun. It was fun. And we need to encourage each other and build each other up. Don't tear each other down. Build each other up. Um, which leads us to, to number four, strong support for leaders. Um, because God is a loving father, he realizes that everybody who puts their faith in Christ, they join his family. Think about that. You and I have been adopted into God's family. We have biological families, but we have a spiritual family. That is so good. That is so good. And notice Paul in verse 12, dear brothers and sisters, he uses this term five times in the, in the, throughout the rest of this chapter. In verse 12, 14, 25, 26, 27, Paul is saying, you are part of God's family. That is a special place. And he's saying, I want to encourage you. So, uh, number four, strong support for leaders. Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work. So Paul is writing the brothers and sisters. Um, they're a young church. Maybe they, they hadn't been taught this, but he's saying sh show honor to those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. Honor can also be translated respect. Um, these leaders were probably elders. They were spiritual leaders, positions of responsibility and leadership in the church. Um, elders, leaders in churches, they provide supervision, protection, discipline, instruction, direction for other believers. And so because elders carried a big responsibility, they also were to be good examples, you know. 
they were to find out what pleased the Lord and go after that and, and model his character. And so because of that, Paul's saying they needed to be honored. Paul kind of goes off on 1 Timothy 5.17, echoing this, elders who do their work well should be respected and paid well, literally should be worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at both preaching and teaching. And so Paul kind of set up this structure. He was a church planter. He'd go into a, a city, a community, start a church. And <clears throat> with Thessalonica, remember, the Jews, the religious community, uh, threatened Paul's life. And so he took off, went to Corinth, but he left the church behind. That's how Paul, he would plant a church, move on to another community. And so he would set up this, uh, this leadership team before, before he left. And that's exactly what's going on here. Um, leaders were chosen to teach sound doctrine, help believers mature spiritually, and equip believers to live for Jesus despite opposition that they were facing in their city. Can I tell you that at Life Church we endeavor to... Teach sound doctrine. Just because you hear from, from this platform, you should always, during the week, go back and read it over to make sure it's true. That's what the Bible's saying. We endeavor to do that, but I want to challenge you. In our culture today across America, there is a wave of progressive Christianity. Progressive Christianity. In other words, Christianity that is being diluted, it's being watered down. Uh, the gospel, the how you can put your faith in Christ is put on the shelf and, and social issues become the forefront. You do not get to heaven by being involved in social issues, friends. It is putting your faith in Jesus Christ. That is first and foremost the most important thing, the most important decision you can ever make. And so we endeavor to teach that and, of course, to teach God's word faithfully. So hopefully you find that to be true. We see that Timothy, because Paul sent Timothy back to kind of get a pulse, a spiritual pulse of the church in Thessalonica when Paul had, had left. And it's possible Timothy came back and said, you know, Paul, there's some, uh, there's some stuff hitting the fan against the leaders, and I think you should address it. So, you know, there's, there's times maybe when you hear God's, words ta God's word taught and Maybe you're into getting your scissors out and cutting parts of your Bible out because you don't feel comfortable with that. Um, or you don't agree with what, what is being taught. But if it's in the Bible, you should embrace it. And so as leaders, spiritual leaders, we have that responsibility. There's... Um, story about a lawyer, a pastor, and a young boy who were on a plane, and the plane had some mechanical problems, and there was no way it was going to be able to land. And the other issue was there were only two parachutes on the plane. And the lawyer said, since I'm the smartest man on the plane, I deserve to survive. And he took the parachute and he jumped out. Well, here's the pastor. To me, this is a great example of what a pastor and how he should live. He looked at the young boy and he said, you take the last parachute. I've lived for Jesus. I'm ready to meet him. And the boy replied, don't worry, pastor. The smartest man on this plane just jumped out with my backpack. You are hearing things today 
under the guise of Christianity. In our you know, media, whatever the marketplace is. Go ahead and jump out of the plane with a parachute. But can I tell you a secret? That's not the truth. As a pastor, as a, as a leader, we have the responsibility to give you the truth. The truth. And it may hurt sometimes, but we want you to survive. We want you to thrive in your relationship with Christ. At the end of the day, we want you to land safely in the arms of Christ. And so, um, that's why Paul says, that it's show that support to, to your leaders. Somebody said, uh, this is what pastors do, they comfort the afflicted and they afflict the comfortable. Last week, a pastor in this country sent a post to his congregation. And this is what he said. Our time at this particular church has come to an end. This is a hard ending to what has been the most amazing, impactful, and special chapter of our lives. Leading this church has been an honor in every sense of the word, and it's impossible to articulate how much we have loved and will always love the amazing people in this church. When we, you accept the calling of being a pastor, you must live in such a way that it honors the mandate, that it honors the church, and that it honors God. When that does not happen, a change needs to be made, and has been made in this case, to ensure that standard is upheld. Over the years, I did not, this pastor is now confessing, I did not do an adequate job of protecting my own spirit, refilling my own soul, and reaching out for the help that was available. When you lead out of an empty place, you make choices that have real and painful consequences. The failure is on me and me alone, and I take full responsibility for my actions, and I now begin a journey of rebuilding Trust. I am deeply sorry for breaking the trust of many people who have loved, we have loved serving and understand that this news can be very hard and confusing for people to hear and process. I pray you can forgive me and that over time I can live a life where trust is earned again. We, talking about his family, we don't know what this next chapter will look like, but we will walk into it together very hopeful and grateful for the grace of God. If you could put your ear to the ground in America, you will hear this every week going out of pastors give in to temptation where they're compromised. That's why Paul says you should be praying, you should be honoring. Not that we're better, we're not better, but there's a target on pastors. There's a target on you. <laughs> we all have targets. But this pastor, who is no longer a pastor, can I tell you, it's going to impact this church. It's going to hurt the cause of Christ. And that's sad. That's sad. I'll tell you this, at Life Church, this is the model. I know Travis and I, if you know us, you would say yes. Mark 10, 45, it says, Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We serve as a servant. We, we, take, we try to take on the character of Christ and model it with humility, that leadership. And so we need your help for that, you know. Um, we walk humbly before God. We walk humbly before you. Because it's a privilege to serve. So, Philippians 2.5, um, 
three through five talk more about that. Uh, number five, a model for staying strong. This is now Paul. He, he, he starts out eight through 11, talking to the body of Christ, brothers and sisters. Uh, 12, 13a, he talks about the leadership of the church. Now he comes back to um, a model for staying strong. And live peacefully with each other, brothers and sisters. We urge you to warn those who are lazy, encourage those who are timid, take tender care of those who are weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. So, yeah, leaders have a special responsibility to guide the church and the believers, but here it is. Notice <coughs> um, verse 14, brothers and sisters. He's saying the body of Christ. That's us, right? Yeah. We're not exempt from the responsibility of caring one for another. In other words, just coming in and going out, that, that's not what Paul's talking about, staying strong in these last days. He's saying we, we, need, to, we need to be engaged with each other. Um, and he's, he goes after even groups in the, in the church. Number one, live peacefully. Look at verse 13a. Uh, he reminds us to live peacefully with each other. <laughs> uh, how many of you know sometimes that takes a little... Little effort on our part, huh? Yeah, dying to self. The best way for this peace to occur is to allow the body of Christ, all believers, to serve in their giftings and to serve um, within that church. To live peacefully. So, how's that working out for you? Good? Good. Number two, warn the lazy. Verse 14a, brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy. Um, that word warn means to firmly admonish, particularly in areas of sin. Notice it doesn't say for the leaders to do this. Here it is, here it is. There should be people in your life that have the freedom to talk to you face to face if they see compromise going on in your life. If you don't have somebody in your world that's able to do that, you need to go find somebody. You need to ask God to bring somebody into your life that has, in other words, if, if you bring up something, all of a sudden they blow up in your face, you know, oh, you tried, right? So, warning, why? Because you care about them, right? If you care about somebody, you want God's best for them. And it's not putting your nose up, I'm better than you, so I'm talking down. No, no, no. When you come in humility, I care about you. You're a friend. We're transparent with each other. Can I tell you, this week I talked to Dave Ogren, and he spoke here a couple weeks ago. We usually talk once a week. And he's that person in my life. I can be transparent with him. He's transparent with me. You know, there's no dark corners. Um, and, so, and so we need that. Um, this word lazy, does that mean lazy? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so people, uh, you, your blood pressure's going up right now. Is he saying I'm lazy? No, no, no. This was used for soldiers. Paul goes back to the soldier example in the Greek who would not stay in the ranks. They would not stay in the ranks. These people had set themselves outside the prescribed pattern of the church. Everybody else was working, serving, but they chose not to. They chose not to. And Paul is, ref is referring to those undisciplined, irresponsible soldiers who are lazy because they're out of position. You're out of position. Paul is saying, get in position. Warn those lazy soldiers, you know, to get in line, Woo! Uh, to keep a healthy church. That's what he's talking about. And just a footnote, Veterans Day this Wednesday, we want to thank all the men and women that served our country. And yeah. Yeah. Be 
understand. Um, September. The year was 2000. There was a Greek ferry boat called the Express Samina. It was loaded with more than 500 passengers. And a lot of those passengers were from other countries visiting Greece. And suddenly, suddenly out of nowhere, this ship plowed into a rocky outcropping. And in minutes, the ferry went down underwater, two miles offshore, claiming the lives of 66 people. But you know what? This tragedy never had to happen. You know why? Because those rock outcroppings, you know, so you got a wall of rock and then you come out. They're marked by navigational charts. The ferry had passed by those rock outcroppings many, many times. In fact, there's a light on top of those rocks that you can see for seven miles. There's no excuse, in other words, to hit those outcroppings. But guess what? The, the captain and three key crew members were not at their post that night. They were down watching a soccer game on television below the bridge. A Greek newspaper headline read, A Blind Course on Autopilot. So the ship was on a complete collision course, but the captain wasn't on the bridge. Tragically, tragically, some of us have left the bridge. Because this captain was so consumed with a soccer game, it cost the lives of 66 people. Paul has been addressing the church at Thessalonica, and he's listed the responsibilities, the challenges that we need to stay engaged in these last days to stay healthy spiritually. And once again, maybe you're, you're not on the bridge. You know, Storms have come, and you've, tr you've gone for cover. You've left the bridge. And your life is going in a direction where you never thought it would. Today we have an opportunity. Once again, maybe, maybe you've been at the bridge, but you've checked out. Life has just beat you up. Maybe you've never been on the bridge, you know. You just let life lead you wherever it wanted to lead you. But this morning, this morning. Jesus Christ, the lover of your soul, wants to have a relationship with you so that you can be with him forever and ever. And this cross that's hanging on the wall is a, it's a mirror of what Jesus did. He went to the cross to pay for my sin debt and your sin debt in full. He took my place. He took your place. And He's preparing a place for you in heaven. Why? Because he loves you. Yeah, he loves you, and he wants you to be where he is. So this morning, maybe you've never put your faith in Christ. But today you say, Lord, I surrender. You know, I surrender. I'm going to get off the bridge and allow you to take over my life. Because when I'm on the bridge, I keep hitting those rocky outcroppings. And in the process, it's destroying people around me. Not only myself, but people that I care about. So Jesus, I put my trust in you. I put all my weight on you this morning. Because I agree with who you said you are. The Savior of the world. You rescued me. You paid for my sin debt in full. I believe it. I believe that's true. So I invite you to come into my life. 
be on the bridge of my life, I give you full control. And by the power of your spirit, I live for you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for your word today. Thank you. We can say yes to you, Lord. We pause to to look at the condition of our souls. If we have strayed, if we've neglected, if we've said no, whatever the case may be, today, Lord, can be a fresh start, a new beginning. Thank you for Paul writing this letter that we can apply to our lives in November 2020. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for encouraging us to pursue our walk with Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing.
stay and worship for a while because God is so good but if you have to leave um, God bless you have a wonderful week uh, and be blessed